Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, we feature Rob Arnott and Kathy Wood's debate from the Morningstar Investment Conference. Russ Kinnell explains the new ratings for a trio of Vanguard funds. David Harrell shows us how to effectively use payout ratios. And Christine Benz gives tips for retiring early. Let's get started. Rob Arnott and Kathy Wood take the stage to discuss Tesla. Well, great to see everybody. Oh, maybe through the lights. It looks like there's people here. Um, welcome to the uh, to the panel here today. So we've got uh, really two great uh, panelists, and uh, we're going to be discussing the uh, investment opportunity set out there, and really focusing in on valuation. And so the two panelists today, obviously Rob here and Kathy joining us over uh, by a virtual link. Um, and both are very experienced in managing equity-based strategies that are widely available through exchange-traded funds, which advisors and investors can use. But it's uh, fair to say that they take a very different approach to, uh, to managing money and identifying opportunities. But from my perspective, if I could have summarized the investment approaches, I would say Rob is a diversified, contrarian, value-oriented manager, and Kathy is a concentrated, disruptive, technology-focused, growth-oriented investor. And so I think it's fair to say that both are trying to beat a market cap index. Uh, they're trying to identify companies that they think are going to do better than the market over the long term. But they go about that in a very different way, and, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to tease that out today with, with Rob and Kathy. and they've both got uh, very strong opinions on their investment approach, and hopefully we'll be, be able to really dig in. You made a very strong case for electric vehicles, but you mentioned Toyota as an example. And obviously, they're the largest you know, auto man manufacturer in the world. So why will Tesla be the one that benefits from that? Why won't you know, uh, the sort of more traditional autos or the many other electric vehicle manufacturers capture that trend? Yes, uh, the traditional auto manufacturers had to make or have to make a major leap. The, the vast majority of their sales today are gas-powered vehicles. Uh, they need to transition to electric. Uh, Tesla's already uh, started electric and has four major barriers to entry, has created four major barriers to entry. One, battery costs. Uh, it built its cars on cylindrical batteries. Most other auto manufacturers are, uh, have based their cars on um, lithium ion pouch batteries. Uh, and the costs of lithium ion pouch are much higher today, uh, I think roughly 15, 20 percent than, uh, than the cylindrical ba batteries that uh, Tesla uses. Tesla is riding the, down the cost curve of the consumer electronics industry. Most other auto manufacturers are not. So its battery costs will be lower uh, for as far as we can see. Uh, the second barrier to entry is uh, the artificial intelligence chip that Tesla designed. Uh, now, uh, Tesla is taking a leaf from Apple's book. Uh, as you will remember, Apple created the concept of a smartphone. It believed that we would have a computer in our pocket. N Nokia, Motorola, and Ericsson did not believe that. They did not design their own chips. And you know where they are today. Apple is uh, 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 dominating the profits the, and the, the profits in the smartphone market. Uh, the other barrier to entry is the number of real world while, uh, miles driven that Tesla has collected. It has uh, more than a million robots out there collecting data and sending it back every day. My car is one of them. And therefore, it is able to discern corner cases and design its full self-driving system to incorporate these corner cases in a way that other auto manufacturers cannot. They don't have chips and they are collecting, uh, uh, you know, millions, not billions and billions of miles with their pilot tests. And then the fourth barrier to entry, and it surprised me this one lasted as long, but I guess the, the dealer system was the reason. Uh, Tesla is still the only car doing over-the-air software updates to, uh, to improve performance and prevent breakdowns. 
Since uh, September of 2018, I have not had to take my car in for any reason except a nail in the tire. The tire went flat. Well, software is not going to solve that problem. Uh, so, but those four barriers to entry, we believe, have put Tesla ahead, and uh, uh, we think the distance actually is increasing. Okay, Rob, you've got some opinions on electric vehicles and also Tesla. I certainly do. Um, <clears throat> we wrote a paper earlier this year um, called The um, Big Market Delusion, which uh, looked at industries that are up and coming that are disruptive. And uh, kudos to Kathy on looking for disruptors. They're very, very important. But disruptors get disrupted. I'll come back to that in a minute. The thing that we found very interesting is you find these cases in the internet bubble, in the supercomputer bubble in the early 80s, uh, the list goes on and on, where every company in the industry is priced at lofty multiples um, as if they're all going to succeed, and yet they're competing against one another. So there will be winners and losers, and the market's pricing things as if they're all going to be winners. Uh, I mentioned disruptors get disrupted. Palm was spun off from 3Com back in the year 2000 at an initial value that was more than 3Com was valued at before the spin-off. And within a day or two was worth more than General Motors. Palm was disrupted. BlackBerry came along with a better product. Um, BlackBerry was disrupted. Apple came along with a better product. And so what we find is, again and again, disruptors are massively important to the economy and to economic growth. But you have to look at, A, how disruptive are they? B, how much of a premium are you paying for that disruption? And C, are they vulnerable to being disrupted themselves? When we looked at the electric vehicle market, um, and incidentally, electric vehicles have, with very few exceptions, have come down sharply since we published that report. Um, when you look at the electric vehicles market, you find that as of the end of 2020, uh, Tesla, which I think at the time was about 25 times sales, uh, Kathy can confirm or uh, correct that, but about 25 times sales. Out of eight specialists in electric cars worldwide, it was the second cheapest. The highest multiple was well over 10,000 times sales because it was a company that had aggregate sales from the previous year that was measured in three digits. I don't mean three digits of production, I mean three digits in dollars. So from that perspective, we can say that you think there's um, the valuations that stretch within the EV space? Yeah, uh, Kathy and I have both been around the industry for a long time, and we saw in the internet bubble that there were countless disruptors, and they were radically reshaping the way we communicate, the way we transact, the way we uh, interact with our clients. And thank goodness for that internet revolution because uh, when COVID came along, all of those innovations turned out to be massively important to all of us. Uh, but the market got ahead of what was likely to happen. Briefly, Cisco was the largest market cap stock on the planet. Um, since that time, for 21 years, They've had 12% annual earnings growth, 13% annual sales growth, and their share price is lower than it was at the peak in 2000, with double-digit growth for 21 years. So the market was expecting stupendous growth. It got impressive growth, but it was priced to reflect expectations of stupendous growth. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long term with Morningstar's podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. Now, here is Russ Kennel from Morningstar Research Services with Susan Jabinski from Morningstar, Inc. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Morningstar recently changed the fund analyst ratings on a trio of Vanguard funds. 
Russ Kinnell is here today to discuss those changes. Russ is Morningstar's Director of Manager Research and Editor of Morningstar Fund Investor. Hi, Russ. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here. So let's talk a little bit first about our fund analyst rating in general and how often analysts review the rating and what might trigger a rating change, either up or down. Sure. So uh, the analyst rating is a forward-looking rating, essentially telling you how do we think this uh, fund will do against its peer group or benchmark. Uh, obviously, gold the highest, negative the worst. Uh, it's a marriage of quantitative and qualitative. So the analysts are rating the parent, the people, and the process, uh, really digging in, trying to do their research, looking for competitive advantages. Uh, but then we also combine that with an estimate for the alpha potential of a category, and then we subtract fees from all that to come up with an estimate of the after fee alpha, and then look at where that slots into uh, an overall rating. So it's, it's a little complicated, but the basic idea is our best guess at what a fund's likely to do over the long haul. Now, we recently upgraded a pair of Vanguard funds. Um, both are pretty popular. The first is Vanguard Dividend Depreciation Index, uh, which moved up from silver to gold um, in April. And then we recently reaffirmed our rating after the fund announced that it was changing its benchmark. So let's talk a little bit about the rating change there. Yeah, so this is one where our underlying pillars did not change. We have it at above average for people in process, high for parent. Uh, but it's very low fee, eight basis points. Uh, so that meant it was really high silver. Um, then when we reran the ratings again to, to rate it earlier this year, uh, it bounced up to gold. So what that usually means is uh, some other funds may have fallen lower, either because of fees or, be, or because we downgraded them. Uh, so in this case, it just bumped higher. And I think it's an outstanding fund. It's It's a really well-designed uh, fund that you can own for the long haul. So a very good fund. It bounced to gold. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, we reaffirmed it. They uh, changed their benchmark to a slightly different one, but really it doesn't change the overall picture for it. So we reaffirmed our rating. And then another upgrade was Vanguard Energy. Uh, we upgraded that one to silver from bronze, and that fund went through a late 2020 makeover in strategy. So let's talk a little bit about that change in strategy and the rationale behind the increase in the rating. That's right. So Vanguard broadened the strategy to a, a wider ranging, not just uh, energy, uh, but wider natural resource uh, view. Um, and uh, we wanted to see how that would settle, uh, but also we wanted to see how the newish manager, Tom Levering, uh, would settle in. He came on board in early 2020, uh, but we upgraded the, the people uh, because we, we felt like um, Levering, though he was fairly sh short experience on this fund, had longer track records with very good performance at a couple of other funds. So that led us uh, to upgrade people and, and upgrade overall rating to silver. And then on the flip side, we downgraded Vanguard International Growth um, to silver from gold after a manager change at one of the fund's sub-advisors. So let's talk a little bit about that one. Uh, yeah, James Anderson, who's the lead on Bailey Gifford, which is the, the main sub-advisor on the fund, uh, is stepping down. And so that led us to take the people rating uh, from high to above average. Uh, but we, we still like the fund. We still think there's some good experienced people who will, who will take Anderson's place. Uh, which is why, obviously, we still have an above average people and a silver overall. So still a very good fund. But when you le lose your leader, a very experienced manager who had a lot to do with the fund success, we felt we should take it down a notch. Well, Russ, thank you very much for your time today and putting some of these rating changes into perspective. You're welcome. I'm Susan Jabinski from Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. Next, David Harrell from Morningstar Investment Management tells us the ins and outs of payout ratios. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Dividend stock investors rely on a company's payout ratio to determine a dividend stability. Joining me today to discuss the ins and outs of payout ratios and how to effectively use them is David Harrell. David is an editorial director with Morningstar Investment Management and editor of Morningstar Dividend Investor. Thanks for being here today, David. Oh, great to be here. So let's start out by defining our terms. What is the payout ratio? What does it tell us? And how is it calculated? Sure. So payout ratio is simply a measure of the portion of a company's earnings that it's returning to shareholders via dividend payments. So if a company uh, earns $5 per share and is paying out $2.50 a year in dividends, it'd have a 50% payout ratio. If it then raised its dividend to $3, that payout ratio would increase to 60%. 
Now, does a high payout ratio always mean that there's, you know, the dividend might be at risk? Not necessarily. So with a payout ratio, you really want to look at it in context and in context of several things. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, there are mature wide moat companies that routinely pay out a large portion of their earnings as, di of dividends, as dividends, particularly uh, in certain sectors such as utilities, for example. Now, um, so you need to look at the payout ratio relative to things like, you know, what's the payout ratio of other firms in the same sector or industry? Um, where does the payout ratio stand relative to management's target for the payout ratio? Oftentimes, management will say, we intend to return 55 to 60 percent of earnings as dividends. You know, where is that payout ratio relative to that? And then finally, look at the payout ratio, uh, where it's how it's changed in recent years. Um, and a good tool for this is go to Morningstar.com, uh, go to a stock report page, go to key ratios, and you can see the payout ratios over the past decade. So if a payout ratio has increased quite a bit over the past few years, is that because management is simply returning more and more cash to shareholders via the dividend? Or is the dividend remain the same? Earnings are eroding, uh, so you're seeing the payout ratio uh, become much larger because uh, because of that s smaller earnings amount. And that's a situation where it might be a cause for concern. Now, clearly in 2020, uh, we saw a large number of firms have their payout ratio spike, uh, in some, some cases over 100%. Uh, now, you know, firms that were sort of healthy dividend payers uh, with strong cash reserves uh, were able to cover their dividend even if it exceeded uh, their earnings for the year. Uh, so they had that temporary spike in the payout ratio, uh, but now we're seeing some of those, those uh, payout ratios return more to their normal range. So then on the flip side, if you see a low payout ratio, does that automatically mean, ooh, this is a stock that's going to give me some dividend growth? Well, you know, there's a tendency to look at that and say, wow, a low number, there's, you know, quote unquote, room to grow the dividend. And that certainly can be the case, uh, particularly if you have a, a younger company that might have only initiated this dividend a few years ago. Uh, they might tend to start out small, uh, but management management might have every intention of increasing that uh, payout ratio, increasing the dividend, and you might expect to see it to grow. Uh, but here's a case where you really want to have a better understanding of where the dividend stands in terms of prioritization of the company's asset allocation. Uh, a company might have a low payout ratio, uh, but the dividend might be a relatively low priority. Uh, it might sort of come last. They might have debt they're paying down. They might have you know, a lot of money they want to spend on R. They might want to devote a lot of funds to R&D. Um, they might actually be more devoted to buybacks uh, than dividends. Uh, so here's something where you just really want to have a better understanding of the prioritization of the dividend. And there's a couple of places you can look for more information on that. Uh, one would be uh, just the shareholder letter and the annual report. Oftentimes you'll see management tout their, you know, dedication to the dividend, the, the length of, you know, the streak of dividend increases, and sort of reiterate that, yes, we are, you know, devoted to growing the dividend. Uh, a better place might even be some of the transcripts of the quarterly earnings calls. So oftentimes the, you'll get questions from analysts about uh, upcoming dividend increases, and, and that's a place where you'll see management literally lay out their priorities uh, for al asset, uh, capital allocation and you know where the dividend stands and if it's you know first in line or third in line uh, so that's that's a you know a way to have a better understanding of uh, sort of management's intention uh, to grow the dividend so David what factors what other factors might dividend seekers be looking at besides that payout ratio if they're trying to find stocks that have stable dividends Sure. So, you know, dividends don't come out of thin air. The cash to pay them have, has to come from a company's earnings and cash flow. Uh, so companies need stable earnings to, to pay their dividends. They need increasing earnings to, um, to increase their dividends. And one tool they might, investors might use is the Morningstar moat rating. Now, moats certainly don't guarantee dividends. But every time we've looked at the relationship between moat ratings and dividends, we've seen a fairly strong correlation. Uh, for example, in 2020, no moat companies were the ones that were most likely to have suspended or reduced their dividends, whereas wide moat companies were the least likely uh, to have cut or suspended their dividends. Well, David, thank you for your time today and for giving us your perspective on this metric, the payout ratio, that's very important to dividend investors. We appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. 
I'm Susan Javinsky with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. And lastly, Christine Benz from Morningstar Inc. gives her insights about early retirement. Hi, I'm Susan Javinsky with Morningstar. Retirements appear to have accelerated during the pandemic. Joining me to discuss what you need to bear in mind if you plan to retire early is Christine Benz. Christine's Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning. Hi, Christine. Thanks for being here. Susan, it's great to see you. So what's prompting all of these early retirements we're seeing? There are different motivations, I'm sure. I I suspect there are some frontline workers who decided to leave their jobs in the wake of the pandemic. It certainly put added stress on them to to do their day-to-day jobs. I think there's another huge contingent of new retirees, would-be retirees, who are looking at this very strong market environment that's prevailed over the past decade plus. So their portfolios are enlarged and they think that they have enough to retire. I would expect that that's a strong motivator for a lot of new early retirees. And then I would say another sort of softer consideration in the mix is that the pandemic has given a lot of people some additional time to think about their lives and the trajectories of their lives. And I think you've got some people deciding that they want to try to live their best life and that doesn't necessarily involve working. So I think that there are a variety of motivations, but I would say those are probably key for a lot of people. So if you are someone who's considering leaving the workforce a little early, what are the main things that you need to be thinking about and have on your dashboard? Well, I would say a key consideration is healthcare coverage. If you are pre-age 65, so you're not yet eligible for Medicare, you've got to figure out where you are going to go for healthcare. And if you're part of a married couple where your spouse is employed, this might be an easy answer where you can go on to your spouse's health care coverage. But if you do not have that luxury, you've got to figure out whether you're buying private insurance or going through the exchanges and factor in that extra cost in terms of your in-retirement budget. Because until you are eligible for Medicare, you will have that headwind of additional bills. And even when you are eligible for Medicare, you do need to bear in mind that you'll have additional health care expenses that Medicare doesn't cover. So you will probably want supplemental insurance coverage, for example. So definitely factor in those health care outlays. Another thing I would mention, Susan, is that we now have a pretty big body of research that points to working longer, even working past the traditional age 65, as being valuable, not just from a financial standpoint, which it obviously is, but also valuable from a health, uh, physical health, emotional health standpoint, that working longer seems to do something for us uh, that keeps us well later in life. So some people think that it might be having that sense of purpose. Maybe it's physical exercise. The fact that getting out there, continuing to work actually gives you a little bit of exercise. And then another big factor is the social consideration. So definitely, I I would say, bear in mind all of that research when thinking about your decision to retire early. You may decide that from a lifestyle perspective, you still definitely want to go ahead and do it. But just do bear in mind the research and bear in mind that working longer doesn't necessarily entail sticking it out at your current job, especially if it's one that you don't love. You may be able to find a career path that gives you that social connection, that gives you that sense of purpose, but doesn't sort of wear on you in that same way. Let's talk a little bit about Social Security, which, of course, you know, you can claim benefits starting at age 62. But should people do that? A big question. I would say that uh, certainly it's attractive from the standpoint of retirees want to replace that paycheck that they had while they're working. And I think that's why many do gravitate to claiming Social Security right out of the box to have that cash flow coming in the door through some source that is not their portfolio. But I would really spend some time running the numbers. One calculator that I recommend is Mike Piper's Open Social Security Calculator. It's a free calculator. Run the numbers on your own situation. Oftentimes, if you're a healthy person, especially if you're a healthy single person 
or you're the main earner in your family, delaying will make sense. You, you don't have to delay all the way until age 70, but you may pick up a benefit by delaying at least past your full retirement age, perhaps a year or two. So run the numbers on that, decide what makes the most sense given your situation. But just remember that Social Security is a lifetime benefit, and if you're able to claim a higher benefit by delaying, that can be incredibly valuable, even if that means that you have to take higher withdrawals from your portfolio early on in retirement. Now, you've always said that it's very important for pre-retirees to sort of sit down and figure out what their portfolio spending rate will need to be in retirement. This is extra important if you're planning to retire early, right? Absolutely, Susan, because there has been a lot of valuable research in this space about what's a safe and sustainable withdrawal rate, but most of it considers a 25 to 30 year time horizon. Very few researchers have looked at a very long time horizon. So you'd want to be more conservative if you expect that you might have a longer than 30 year time horizon in retirement. You'd certainly want to take less than say the standard 4% starting portfolio withdrawal. And there are reasons to be cautious on withdrawal rates, even if you're retiring at a normal or a traditional retirement age, because of the investment environment that we find ourselves in, where we have very low bond yields today. We have not inexpensive equity valuations, which portend a not great environment for investors over the next decade. And that calls for being conservative on the withdrawal rate front. So definitely don't just take the 4% guideline and run with it. My bias would be to be more conservative given where we are today. And then lastly, Christine, what about from an investment standpoint? How should a younger retiree be thinking about positioning his or her portfolio? It's a big topic, Susan, but I would say one major thing to bear in mind is risk tolerance versus risk capacity. And know what the difference is and don't confuse the two. So risk capacity means the amount of risk that you can take given your proximity to needing to spend your money. If you're getting close to retirement, if you're in retirement, you'd want to have some safe assets in your portfolio to tide you through if the market environment is not great, especially in the early years of your of your retirement. A lot of people retiring today have pretty high risk tolerances, meaning that they feel okay with tolerating equity, tolerating equity market volatility, tolerating volatility in their portfolios. And so they might say, equity risk, bring it on. I, I have done this through my whole career and I'm ready to keep holding lots of stocks. But just make sure that you're not confusing those two concepts. Risk Capacity becomes even more important as you get close to drawdown mode. You do need to have some safe assets in your portfolio, even though the return potential is really low on cash and bonds today. Well, Christine, thank you so much for your perspective today. Um, You've given people a lot to think about what they should be thinking about before they turn in that resignation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm Susan Javinsky with Morningstar. Thank you for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services, LLC, is a subsidiary of Morningstar, Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, 
investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.